federal government targets 11% revenue to GDP ratio by the end of 2022. Tribunal stops multi-choice from increasing DSTV, GoTV subscription rates. U.S. economy gains 431,000 jobs in March. And Putin signs decree mandating Europe to pay for Russian gas in rubles from Friday. This is Business Express coming to you on the network service of the NTA. And I am Benny Adams, your guide. It is the last day of the week and the first in the month. I'll start by saying happy new month, but not April Fool. I always say President Mahmoud Bwari has directed the Bank of Industry to regard all parts of the country as its theater of business operations. Inaugurating the bank's TAR II building in the Central Business District of Abuja, the president said the impact of interventions by the financial institution must also be felt across Nigeria. This government extended the single-digit interest rate loans to manufacturers. In furtherance of this mandate, the Bank of Industry has disbursed over 1.4 trillion naira to over 4.2 million beneficiaries, including micro, small, medium, and large enterprises creating over 9 million jobs from the inception of its administration in 2015. Just first euro bond guarantee, as well as the first euro dominated bond transaction from Nigeria, creating a benchmark for other prospective issuers from Africa. We have raised close to $4 billion in the last four years from over 100 international banks and investors from over 20 countries. We believe that in the next few years, we could increase that figure to $10 billion. More federal government-owned enterprises have now been included in the second phase of the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative in a bid to shove off the nation's revenue. Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, who disclosed this in Abuja at a one-day event, said the country's revenue to GDP ratio now stands at 9% as at 2021, with an 11% target by the end of 2022. Leah Katumbaba today completes the story. Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative SRGI was launched by the federal government in 2019 to identify, develop and implement strategies, projects, policies and initiatives to diversify and boost the revenue base of the country. It targets to achieve 15% revenue to GDP ratio by the year 2050. With the first phase over, Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning Zainab Ahmed say government plans to migrate the existing 10 government enterprises into the second phase of the initiative and have now included 55 other enterprises not in the first phase of the program. Continue to work hard, make the necessary sacrifices and take the bold and decisive actions to do things differently, better more efficient while being mindful that the nation depends on us to generate revenue on a sustainable basis to be able to meet the development needs of our citizens. Accountant General of the Federation, Ahmed Idris, said over 1.2 trillion naira was raised in the first phase of the SRGI implementation. I'm hoping that we will now bring all the remaining 55 federal government-owned enterprises on board and uh, to actualize the targeted revenue uh, figure 
of uh, about 2.33 trillion for 2022. The retreat gave an opportunity to share experiences and ideas as well as update participating agencies of developments in government's revenue generation efforts, collections and remittances. And uh, President Mahmoud Buhari has approved the reappointment of the entire executive management of the Nigeria Export Import Bank for another five-year term. The reappointment was contained in a statement by Yunus Atanku Abdullahi, Special Advisor, Media and Communications to the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. Those involved in the reappointment are Ababello, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Balabello, Executive Director, Corporate Services, and Stella Okutete, Executive Director, Business Development. The statement added that the board performed well as exemplified by key achievements that include an increase in operating profits previously in the negative of 8.030 billion naira at the inception of the current management increased to 3. 0.825 billion naira in 2021. Non-performing loans reduced from 94% in 2017 to 29% as at December 2021. Increase in the total assets of the bank, enhanced liquidity, high growth in recoveries, and improved disbursement. A competition and consumer protection tribunal sitting in Abuja has restrained the multi-choice Nigeria Limited from increasing its tariff on cost of products and services scheduled to begin this Friday. The three-member tribunal presided over by Thomas Okosun gave the order following an ex parte motion by Festus Onifadi a legal practitioner on behalf of himself and the Coalition of Nigeria Consumers. Other members of the tribunal are Shola Salako Ajulo and Ibrahim El Yakubu. In the ruling, the tribunal ordered MultiChoice to stop the planned hike in tariff and cost of its products and services pending the hearing and determination of the motion. More than 15 million decent jobs must be created for Africa by 2025 if governments are serious about making a dent in its unemployment crisis. According to a new charter launched Thursday, the 40 organizations behind the coalition warned that the continent is at the tipping point of what could be the economic breakthrough from the pandemic. But only if investments are made now to prioritize job creation and harness the potential of youth, with Africa's population expected to double and reach 2.5 billion people by 2050, Africa's jobless youth risks cast in the shadow over its economic growth. Recent figures from the African Development Bank Group show that while 10 to 12 million youth enter the workforce each year, only 3 million formal jobs are created, leaving more than half of the new entrants into the labor market unemployed. The organization warned that without a commitment to effective tackle the effectively tackle the unemployment crisis, such as investing in the tech and digital industries, as well as green jobs opportunities, modernizing agriculture to increase productivity, and ensuring the successful implementation of the African continental free trade area. And now, while the government is grappling with raising the number of jobs in the country, infrastructure is being damaged by citizens, making it seem to a large extent as waste. Nigeria is yet to attain the required infrastructure to GDP ratio, which is estimated to run into trillions of naira in annual investment. Now with the pandemic and other effects hampering growth, how will Nigeria raise her taxes to a point they would serve needs above current debt levels? I have with me Mustafa Ndajiwo. He is the founder and executive director of the African Center for Tax Governance. You are welcome to Business Express. Thank you. Well, from the introduction, let's uh, have your assessment of the current tax drive by authorities in the country. There is a problem of, of deficits in, in, in our budgets, and we need to shove off revenue to meet these challenges. What's your assessment of the current tax drive? So the current tax drive, in my opinion, there has been some, some improvements over the years in terms of tax collection because we've come to a realization in Nigeria that taxes are very, very important, particularly if you look at uh, how our economies have been 
behaving in the last in the last few years. Tax has been seen now to be to be one of the most, if not the most sustainable means of financing. So this has led to a lot of efforts from FIRS to customs as well as the state's uh, revenue authorities. However, there is still significant room uh, for improvement. Although there's been a slight increase in the tax uh, GDP ratio, that can also be argued from another perspective that that may also be, uh, there, there may be other reasons. Uh, you could also count inflation and other reasons uh, where you have that kind of uh, uh, growth. But um, like I said, there's significant room for, for improvement. There's this multiplicity of, of tax. You have tax from local governments, you have tax from states, you have tax from federal uh, government. And in, with all of these tax authorities, numbering about 37 or 38 in the country, you still hear figures from NBS or the FIRS say just about 41 million Nigerians pay tax. And out of this is personal income tax from government workers who's, um, it's, it's, it's from their PE. As their salaries come, it's deducted from source. And we have a population of over 200 million uh, people, though you can see there are some who are not into business, there are some who shouldn't collect tax. How can we expand this tax net to get more people to fund the much needed infrastructure that is required? It's a it's a multifaceted pro problem. So first of all, I think one of the most one of the underlying issue in Nigeria is is the issue of trust, uh, trust between the citizens and the government. Um, we've seen that the government has made some efforts uh, towards that. Uh, particularly this current government, we've seen a lot of investment in infrastructure, and these are visible things that, that citizens see and say that the government is actually working. But I think a lot of investment needs to be made into that first to gain the trust of the citizens, and that is what is going to improve the social contract and give the, 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 the government the, the sort of legitimacy it has to collect taxes. But in terms of practical steps to be taken, uh, there has to be a lot of investment in tax administration and this uh, investment towards bringing people into the tax net, identifying uh, taxpayers who are eligible to pay taxes. Working on the compliance framework, we have very, very weak compliance framework, addressing risks in terms of compliance. I think if we invest in these areas, we will uh, improve significantly in bringing people into the tax net and taxing them appropriately. Okay, we've seen governments through the FIRS try to bring in some, some reforms to improve compliance, to in encourage ease of doing business and improve compliance of tax collection with the, the Finance Act and also deployment of, of technology. Is that in, enough? How can this be directed appropriately for us to have more people into this tax net? Yeah, so, so technology is the easiest part because anybody can develop a, a, a system, but it's the implementation. And with implementation, you need people, you need resources. So, and when I say you need people, I, I mean internal and external. So internal, the staff, for example, the FIRS have, um, they've, they, they recently deployed uh, an in-house uh, system, which is currently being used. However, it does not stop there because even if you have the best systems, if you don't have a good compliance framework, nobody will want to pay taxes, right? So it's one thing. It's very, uh, it's good that we ha we have made significant I investment in technology because, uh, as you know, the, the whole economy has become digitalized, and uh, it's good to see that our not just the FIRS but also state revenue authorities are investing significantly in uh, in digital transformation. But it's not it's it's not enough. It's not enough. Okay, technology I, is I, one agree, agreeing with you of of not being enough because with all these reforms uh, coming into play, which has actually improved uh, the, the collection, we still see slower revenue compared to government spending. What's the implication of this current reality? The, the implication of generating lower revenues uh, uh, as compared to uh, the needed expenditure is deficits, continued deficits and most likely increased debts, increased debt servicing. That is the, that is the simple implication that I, I can point out. So what's the way out of that? The way out of that is to, to prioritize spending. On the spending side, you have to prioritize spending, focusing on the SDGs. And then in terms of revenue, make significant investment in tax administration, both at the federal and the state, and the state levels. Invest in institutional capacity, individual capacity of staff. Work on increased trust between citizens and the government. Well, talking about um, 
spending, government spending, prioritizing government spending. Some people have the view that there is so much expenses by government, there is need to cut costs. Do you share such a view? And if you do, how do you think government can reduce spending and cut costs, particularly for political office holders? Yes, so, so there's definitely uh, significant room for government to cut, cut down costs. I know efforts have been made. Uh, in terms of merging uh, ministries and agencies. However, there's still, there's still a lot to be done. For example, if you look at our recurrent expenditure, our recurrent expenditure is still very, very, very high compared to capital, and it shouldn't be so. So uh, the question is, the government really needs to, to make a decision. And uh, these are not, very, are not going to be very easy decisions because the civil service, a lot, there's a lot of reports out there that shows that the, the civil service, a lot of, there's a lot of redundancy in the civil service, first of all. And then looking at our political office holders, they have a retinue of aides and those, these aides traveling, allowances and all that. So really, if, if we do look into, into this, I think there's a significant room to, to reduce uh, this uh, expenditure, focusing spending on priorities. There are present challenges our country is going through that has necessitated people migrating from state to state, safer grounds, people moving to villages and all of that. How does that impact on revenue generation and service delivery? So, so on our service, service delivery, on service delivery, particularly when you have uh, people, because you have more of people migrating from the rural areas to the urban areas, the main implication is that uh, the infrastructure in those urban areas will be overwhelmed. And uh, we all know that, like I just mentioned, the capital expenditure is not, is not much. So we do not have enough infrastructure to, to take on the population, the, gro the population growth, the urbanization. So that is going to be a serious problem. In terms of revenue, I'm not quite sure how how that will play out um, because most of the people that move to the uh, to the urban areas are usually people low middle uh, mi middle income. So I'm not entirely sure if that will have a significant impact in terms of revenue for the urban areas where they moved into, uh, but it might have more impact on the rural areas that they left if those rural areas have. Uh, a good system of collecting taxes in any case. Well, in as much as uh, we're looking out on how to get to bring more people into the tax net, some of the view that taxes can actually be increased or so some things that are not being taxed before can, can be taxed. Are these the best of times for this to happen? Though there are reforms being pushed towards uh, taxing the digital uh, space, how do you see that helping increase revenue collection? So, so it's two things. One, uh, the government can decide to optimize revenue. So that's what we call optimizing revenue. Optimizing revenue does not necessarily mean increasing the tax rate. So, and I give you an example. For example, the VAT now is set at 7.5 percent. There's been a lot of calls to increase the VAT rate because the VAT, our VAT rate is one of the lowest in the world. Yeah. However, even with the current 7.5 percent VAT rate, if we make significant investment in compliance, if we're able to achieve at least 50 to 60 percent compliance on VAT, that will shoot up our revenues significantly. So we don't necessarily have to increase the VAT rate uh, as an example. However, there are areas where we can increase increase tax, and I see I've seen that. The Finance Act, the, uh, through the Finance Act, the government has made efforts, for example, on tobacco, increasing uh, taxes on, on what we call sin taxes, taxes that are supposed to uh, sort of affect the behavior of the taxpayer. And on the other, on the other hand, Which also is beneficial. Beneficial, to the exactly. And on more the other like, hand, more like, also. More like some sort of regulation. Exactly. And on the other hand, also provide revenues. And these revenues, the idea is that these revenues will also address those externalities that are caused by those, those behaviors. So there are other areas, luxury items. You can increase VAT on luxury items, on luxury goods, uh, and luxury services. These are areas uh, that you can look at. But also, Nigeria, as we know, it, we have a huge extract, extractive industry. Um, a lot of investment needs to go in there in terms of um, increasing, increasing compliance. International tax generally, and like you rightly mentioned. Rentals, licenses, and all of exactly. that. Exactly. Thank you so very much, Mustafa and Dad, you all for sharing your thoughts with us. It's much more about compliance, compliance or compliance, and expanding the tax net. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thank you very much.
Well, moving on, the Minister of Mines and Steel, Ola Milekon Adebite, says the federal government has committed over 30 billion naira intervention to revitalize the solid mineral sector and to attract foreign investment for the growth and development of the Nigerian mining industry. The minister stated this during the weekly State House media briefing organized by the presidential communications team. Our research uh, uh, laboratory in Kaduna has been enhanced to world standard. If you find anything, it has to be analyzed when you dig and go to the ground. Uh, so in the past, people have to send their samples to Canada or to South Africa or at times to Australia so that they can do the analysis for you. What you have found is 50% gold, is 1% uh, sand, this and all that. Now we have a laboratory in Kaduna. It can do own analysis. It doesn't get better than that. Now let's take a look at prices of commodities in the local and international market. Russia has a new demand. All foreign buyers must pay in ruble for Russian gas. This will be enforced from today. If the payments are not made, the contracts will be halted. Vladimir Putin, the Russian president on Thursday, signed a decree saying foreign buyers must pay in rubles for Russian gas from Friday, April 1st. Reuters reports that Putin says contracts will be halted if the payments were not made in the preferred currency. He directed that to purchase Russian natural gas, they must open ruble accounts in Russian banks. It is from these accounts that payments will be made for gas delivered. Meanwhile, European nations have rejected the ultimatum and Berlin said it amounted to blackmail. Russia supplies about a third of Europe's gas. Nigerian stocks reversed Thursday gains to begin April on a fool's run. The NGX All Share Index dropped some notches to 46,842.86 basis points. Equity capitalization declined to 25.253 trillion naira. 257 million shares valued at 2.863 billion naira were traded in 4,586 deals. UBA, Fidelity Bank, and Zenit Bank stopped the activity a chart. U.S. economy gains 431,000 jobs in March and a wages such again as labor markets powers ahead with stock futures rise in early Friday trade. How are they faring? Hello and welcome to the Global Market Review. European markets notched higher this Friday to start the second quarter with talks between Russia and Ukraine continuing to guide investor sentiment. Now the DAX in Germany added 0.1% to 14,428.82. London's FTSE gained 0.38% and Francis CAC 40 topped 0.53%. U.S. stocks also rose in early trading as investors assessed a new quota of trading and a troublesome bond market recession indicator. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 154 points, S&P 500 appreciated by 0.35%, and Nasdaq 100 rose 0.29%. In Asia, stocks were in mixed territory as a private survey showed Chinese manufacturing activity shrank in March. Chinese 
technology stocks in Hong Kong saw sizable losses on Friday, with Alibaba falling 2.14%, even as the Hasang index recovered from earlier losses to close 0.19% higher at 22,039.55. The Shanghai Composite also appreciated by 0.94%, while in Japan, the Nikkei 225 slipped 0.56%. Similarly, it was mixed trading for African markets this first trading day of April, with Kenya, Tunisia and Namibia coming off a down session, while South Africa and Ghana were marginally positive. And that's Global Market Review. It's back to you, Kristen. That wraps Business Express for this week. See you on Monday.